Hello, gang. You are at the post-lunch panel about data collection, use, and disclosure. So <laughs> I have uh, a paparazzi over there who's going, raise the roof. Um, so yeah, we're going to keep it um, on and popping. So we have a great panel. I'm going to allow everyone to introduce themselves, but I will tell you in advance that everyone is very esteemed and impressive and um, if they don't use the superlatives, just put extra, extra in front of everything that they say because they will be far too humble. Um, my name is Yolanda Skiles. I'm the moderator um, of the panel. Um, I was in the Valley for quite some time. Um, started off here at Stanford Law and uh, went to Fenwick and West for a few years, then was in-house at Yahoo uh, for several years. Um, made my way back to the West Coast in Washington, D.C. not too long ago where I've worked for a um, data encryption company, software company called SafeNet, and recently joined Oric Harrington as counsel in their IP group. Um, so with that, I will lead now with um, Joe DeMarco. He's not Joseph. Either one is fine. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Yolanda. Uh, my name is Joseph DeMarco. I'm a partner at the law firm of DeVore and DeMarco in New York, which is a boutique law firm specializing in data privacy and security and cybercrime uh, legal issues. I used to run the cybercrime unit at the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York and did that for about 10 years from 1997 to 2007. And in my practice, spent a great deal of time dealing with regulators, law enforcement officials, uh, and referring matters to law enforcement uh, for them to conduct investigations and prosecutions. Next week, am I alive? Uh, Lothar. Thank you. I'm Lothar Dieterman. I'm a partner at Baker McKenzie in Palo Alto, and I teach privacy law at Hastings and Yergo in Stanford. Hi, I'm Sarah Harrington. I'm from LinkedIn, and you can find a lot about me on my LinkedIn profile. That's a shameless plug. Um, when, we, when we're at LinkedIn, we actually do these uh, all-hands meetings every two weeks where you have to um, sort of three people are chosen at random new employees to go up in front of the whole company and introduce themselves and you have to either talk about something that's not on your LinkedIn profile or do a talent, which often is an animal sound. So um, I'm not gonna do either of those. <laughs> <laughs> but you can. Why not? You can. Um, I'm Benjamin Lee, I'm a legal director over at Twitter, head of litigation and IP. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, and uh, my, uh, Twitter handle is at Ben L as another shameless plug. Um, it's a, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Bart Volkmer. I'm an attorney at Dropbox, and I work on litigation, regulatory, privacy, security, a bunch of different stuff. Since we're a startup and don't have a big team, I get the pleasure of working on a lot of different stuff. Okay, great. Um, so we're gonna, we have sort of a topical outline, but I really want to hold myself to the promise that there will be questions, because I've been at some panels where uh, I'm sure there looked like a lot of people who wanted to interject, so I want to reserve some time at the end so that we can get you engaged, and if there's something that's very boring, you can just yawn and we will kindly move on, uh, but hopefully we can keep it, it, keep it moving and exciting. So first we're going to start with um, big data um, and cloud storage. Um, I think as we collect more and more volumes of information about users' activity on the web and what they're doing and their clickstream and where they're going after they leave your site, um, we just begin to have massive amounts of data. Um, and the question is sort of what to do with it, how to handle it, and is it technically feasible to anonymize it, aggregate it to make it useful, or is it just going to end up um, you know, on tape in Iron, Iron Mountain like it often does in a lot of companies. So I will let uh, Bart lead with that. Sure. I mean, there, there was one point that I wanted to make on big data. We, um, we at Dropbox, we store everyone's stuff, and, and usually we want to do exactly what the, what the user wants us to do with their data. So if you upload files to Dropbox, we want to be able to store that data securely for as long as you want us to do it. So our, ma our main um, mission is to store your stuff safely and securely. So um, that means that there's a lot of data that, that gets stored at Dropbox, and that means for our users, um, data is becoming more ubiquitous, it's becoming more cheap, they're able to store tons and tons and tons of stuff at very low cost. And I think there's some ramifications for us um, as lawyers and practitioners in that do you really want to be keeping, um, data, as an end user, do you want to be keeping data around forever? And what are the ramifications of that down the road for um, civil discovery, um, for criminal requests? Do you really want to be accumulating and accumulating and accumulating data? And as we go into um, a, a world where storage is so cheap, um, I think that's something that people need to be on the lookout for because the temptation, I think, is just to sit back and let the data accumulate. But I think at some point you need to pause and, and give that some thought. Um, I think Lothar had some thoughts about big data and, and the ramifications as well. You know, one point I want to make on that, like as a takeaway to kick it off, is I think as we 
think global and act local, we also need to talk local about it. And we heard on the previous panels the European view on data protection law, quite different from how we are all excited about massive amounts of data here. Sounds like a cool thing when we just heard that people are lighting up and big data sounds better than medium-sized data or small <laughs> data. And so we're all excited about this here, right? But from the European angle, probably when you say big data there, then what they hear is massive amounts of data used for a new purpose that it was not originally collected for, nobody's been told about it, nobody's been asked consent for, because the whole purpose of big data is that you do research and analysis that you could previously not do. So I think it's important that we know that when we speak to European customers, regulators, distributors, and so on, that we emphasize the good things about our services and not just use this term big data. I don't think it's a helpful one, particularly um, in other countries. Right. The, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. The, the other one is cloud, but similarly, I mean, we're all excited about clouds here, especially on a day like this, but when we hear cloud here and we hear cloud in Europe, cloud is synonymous for you don't really see through it, you don't know where the data is anymore, um, we have so many different vendors, we don't even know where they are, and so we can't tell you in the agreement and so on, and that is directly contrary to the European concept that data controllers are responsible for personal data, they have to protect it, they have to secure it. So the term cloud also, as cool as it sounds here, is probably not suited to overcome concerns in Europe, concerns that are growing these days. So my recommendation there is also that companies are very specific about what they mean by their particular service and might be good for marketing here in the US to jump on the cloud bandwagon. That's a famous site from um, Larry Ellison many years ago. He said that's not really new, but we'll use the term too for marketing. And I think we have to be just careful about it on the privacy mm -hmm. section. I wanted to say that as um, following on on the previous panel and give that as one practice to think about how you present your service, how you explain them, and how you're transparent about it. On the last panel was also represented from the FTC and made similar comments and concerns. The FTC is also um, establishing a concept of data minimization as one of the important principles and says that if you say in your privacy statement that you have reasonable security, that that means you're only collecting and storing data that you need to perform whatever service you're performing. It's not in the law here in the US, as uh, one of the last panelists post, um, pointed out, but it is a position that the FTC has been taking in guidance guidance, schmidens, as I heard on the last panel too on this topic. But the, the practice here should be that companies plan ahead and decide what they want to store and whether they can anticipate early on what they might be doing with it and at least try to anticipate it, be transparent about it and give some information and disclosures early on on their website. It is often not that hard to foresee what the business people probably want to do with the data in a few years. Um, it is becoming a data-driven economy um, for a while now. Um, you read gene patents are going away and the value is all going to be in the data. It affects biotech information technology for a long time. So I think companies need to anticipate that and early on plan ahead. And if you think you want to keep this data and it's really going to be good for research, maybe start saying that as part of the services that you're providing is going to be this research, customization, and other things, stress the positives, and be more and more transparent about exactly what is being collected. I think that's another practice that, that should have um, sunk in from the previous panel, and it um, is our first bullet point, big data, cloud, data retention, to be conscious about it, document it, and start anticipating what the business wants and offering that in the terms. Many companies have a difficult time with anticipating and changing their terms and conditions. They may have to ask the consumers again. That's always a hard choice to make, so I'm not saying you have to immediately rush and do it. But you can put that on your annual updating our terms segment. What is it that we're planning in the pipeline and start to address that? Because if you do start disclosing this as a purpose and you collect data after disclosing that after a while, you can, and even under those laws in Europe, privacy laws that require that purposes being disclosed. Right. And I actually was going to add a point that I hadn't thought about before. Promising unlimited storage, which was very huge. If you can remember, um, when I was at Yahoo, Gmail came out with unlimited storage. And so Yahoo said free unlimited storage too. And before it was sort of, um, you know, you would have sort of a certain amount of data and then after a certain cap, you'd have to pay. Um, so eventually, sort of the unlimited storage became, well, you're at 75% of your inbox. And I'm like, wait a minute, I thought I had unlimited. 
So um, similarly with Shutterfly, um, this is again from just a consumer standpoint, I've been using Shutterfly since 04. And then they sent out an email saying, sorry, uh, if you haven't used our service or paid us any money in the last X years, we're going to shut you down. And I'm like, no, no, no. So then they actually had to sort of reverse course and go, I'm really, really sorry. That was all a mix up and uh, we'll keep your stuff forever. But yeah, please pay us money from time to time. Um, so I think when you make the promises that we're going to keep like your, your email active forever or we'll you know, deactivate it if you don't use it after a certain point or you have unlimited storage or we have a premium model that you get one gig at this price and then you have to reprice it. I think that's something also to think about with big data. What promises are you making to the consumer about your service, whether it's Dropbox or any other sort of di digital storage locker and are you keeping them? And then frankly, when business conditions change, um, how are you able to sort of roll out a new pricing model or a new financial structure where you're sort of uh, going to sort of modify the, the, the previous um, contract. Um, so any, any other feedback on that? Yeah, I think you know, we're going to talk in a little bit about requests for information. And I think that you know, when, as a precursor to getting into that, I think really there, it really comes down to four broad points. Uh, and the specifics are going to vary by your organization. But from the perspective of an outside counsel that deals with companies that are asked to produce information for the government or in litigation or otherwise, I think it really comes down to these four. First is just collect what you need. Um, you know, just because you can collect something doesn't mean you can, should collect something. Um, and there are plenty of uh, technology service providers that are out there that are willing to, and quite frankly, you know, spend their, their, their time pitching to your business people all the data that, you know, your business people should be collecting. But do you really need it, right? Collect just what you need for your business. Second, make sure that you have it lawfully, that you've collected it lawfully. And again, that's going to vary from place to place and jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And your terms of service and privacy policy are going to inform that as well. But do you have it lawfully? The third thing is, I think, a softer point, but nonetheless one that's very important. Be, be able to explain to someone in plain English why it is you collect that information. You know, why do you have it? And Hopefully, there's a good business reason or there's a good legal reason or a good compliance reason to have it. But if you can't explain why you're collecting some data, then maybe you shouldn't be collecting that data. And then the fourth thing is, obviously, secure it well and dispose of it when you no longer need it. The truth of the matter is, if you don't have data, then you can't be in a position to turn it over to a third party that wants it, nor can you be in a position to lose it and run afoul of some FTC requirement or get sued by plaintiff's attorneys. So I think good data management practices really come down to those kind of four cardinal principles. And if you are good on those four, your odds of getting in any kind of trouble or getting crosswise with someone who wants the data from you drop down dramatically. Well, actually, I'm going to ask uh, some of our business people, our in-house people, sort of, you know, how, how is need defined? Because I'm sure engineers or business people go, there's always, I mean, data is always good. Like, the more, the better. Um, and I think the need changes, but I think given that sort of companies' valuations are based upon sort of being able to amass amounts, you know, massive amounts of data about what users want, what they clicked on, what they didn't click on, what they searched on, where they went to when they left your site, um, I, I just wonder if, if there's any way to sort of like push back on sort of a, a narrowing of the definition of need. I'm happy to speak to it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think engineers have a very different understanding of what is needed, and uh, if you ask them, probably more is better, and all of it is great. Um, and I think kind of that's their go-to, because they don't know what they might need, and that's how they think about things. They're, they're engineering, they're sort of operating in a very dynamic place, and technology is pushing them all the time, and so these data sets allow them and give them the insights they need to build new products. So. I think at the end of the day, it kind of goes to a sort of an internal kind of best tips is as a lawyer, get in there, get with your engineers and understand what they are actually collecting. Because I think there can be kind of the policy about let's just collect what we need. And I think there could be a, a huge disconnect between the engineering and product people and actually the legal folks who are sort of thinking about it in more narrow terms and writing the privacy policies. So that would be my first thing is to really get in there and do inventories and and kind of keep checking in because things change. And it's going to change whether you're on a mobile device or, or an iPad or a computer. Um, and then I think the other thing to really sort of do, and one of the things that um, I, I've only been at LinkedIn for a year, and it's the first company I've ever worked at. And one of the things that um, was really fascinating with me is, is we have these values on our walls, and people actually follow them and believe in them. And that's kind of neat to be at a company where that's the case. And so one of those primary values is members first. And so what has gone from top to bottom is this idea is that 
we're doing everything for our members first and not necessarily for revenue. And when you kind of can change the mindset that way, you can have the engineers collect data because it's going to be good for the member. It'll result in a valuable service or something for them and not just necessarily data that the company can try to exploit later. And um, they really buy that into that, and we as a company all buy into that. And that makes it so that the lawyers and the engineers are not necessarily at odds. We're sort of working towards the same purpose, and that really allows you to have discussions and things say things like, well, is collecting that data really members first? And we're talking the same language. Yeah, I'm not certain I have much to add to that, Sarah. That's, um, I, I think the one thing I think I might say is that in addition to kind of worrying about how to secure the user's data um, and then how to get rid of it, like when you don't need it, um, you might also consider, of course, the question of how do the users get access to it? In other words, can they extract it from the system? Um, that's a feature that we just um, recently launched. And I, it, it's one of those ironic things you think would be pretty straightforward as an engineering issue. It was not. It was um, pretty hellish to get this thing to work. But that's another thing in the back of your head because it's the last thing the engineer is thinking about is, oh my gosh, maybe the user might want to export this data at some point. And so it's better to put that on the roadmap earlier rather than later. Yeah, and I, I think that one other thing you can do is when you're working with engineering teams is they, they'll, they'll say, we want to log X field for X purpose, and it sounds all very good. There's an articulable business purpose. It all sounds great. Um, I'll ask, well, can we expire this data after a certain period of time, or can we anonymize the data, or if it's IP, do we really need the last octet, or if it's, if, if it's a particular piece of data, do we need it on an, an individual user basis, or can we log in the aggregate? These things that are protecting users and making it, making it better for users in the long run, so we just don't have tons and tons of data about users while still fulfilling the business purpose, I think that's something, those are the conversations I try to have um, internally. Yeah, I think the, the point of minimizing data minimization a little bit there by not just saying all or nothing, you can't have the data yeah. at all, you can have something that is partially hashed right. or so. And to add to that, I think, is other points. We'll get to that when we talk about government access as well. Where do you have it? So it's one thing to have it in one super secured area where only a few engineers have access to and they do use it for research and so on. So I'm a little more bullish about it. I would let them play with it if it's somehow possible and it's disclosed and you have a white paper explaining to your customer why it's necessary or some disclosures. But then have it in one place, have it heavily secured, and not everybody in the, government, in, in the company has access to it in every jurisdiction that may be subject to litigation and, and other things. So I think on the minimization, one of these technological measures, and then also geographically within the company to have access controls in place and document those well. Um, on the retention, I would say it's very hard to do because there's minimum retention requirements. The Europeans have laws that have been challenged in a number of jurisdictions now how long you must keep data so it's available to the government and when you have to delete it. And that's very difficult to uh, comply with. But I'd say to every company, to do something in that area is better than to do nothing. So some companies just throw up their head because it's so difficult and they do nothing and they keep everything for, forever. And that's, you, you can do a lot of things with a relatively small budget that goes to the right direction. If you're a young company, if you have as a default rule, we delete everything when we're seven, then that's a step in the right direction so that people will start have to justify why they want to keep it more than seven years or 10 years, whatever the magic number is. There will be some areas where you have to be careful. You may need it longer or you definitely need it longer. And, but just to start building that into the DNA in the company so that 30 years old and you still have everything, I think that is important and will mitigate some of the risks that we've been discussing before. Right, yeah. Oh, sure, go ahead. Um, what about And I guess the question would be, do you have independent liability to the extent that they engage in some sort of unfair consumer practice, whether or not you would be sued or the subject of the investigation because you are somehow inducing it or encouraging it? 
Joe? Yeah, I mean, I think that you do need to be concerned about all those, and indemnification may help you. I mean, their, your, your general obligations are going to be found under principles of negligence law and tort law. The truth of the matter is, though, regardless of whether or not you would win that litigation at trial or even on a motion to dismiss, your reputational issues and associated regulatory issues are not going to mean that your business is going to be in a good position if it's sued. And the fact of the matter is, if you're here in the U.S., you're easy to find, you know, you're a reputable business, you know, you're going to be the target of, I don't know, where the FTC lawyer is out here, but I think he would say, he would say, you're not in the clear. And I think that's the operating principle you need to work under. I, I would give a slightly different tweak in the sense that if you deal with legitimate enterprise customers, I don't think you have to monitor every step they're taking. You could give them some guidelines. I think you should design your technology, as an important point made on the last panel, in a way that they could have um, responsible data management practices. So if you set up your platform so that everything must be kept forever and it's really hard for the customers to delete something, then you're probably contributing, like Joe said, in, in some bad practices ultimately. So, But if you set up a platform that could be responsibly used and you have responsible users, I would not go completely overboard on managing them. Um, I think it's largely their responsibility what they upload. And if you have really bad customers, that there's some due diligence you'll have to do about it for money laundering and other purposes you'd, you'd have to be careful about. But I wouldn't put privacy at the list of my, at, at the top of my list of concerns then. Right, great. So now I think we're going to launch into, I, I think, what um, may be um, one of the more controversial um, um, topics that we're going to discuss is this, how to do, respond to government requests. So when we got this panel, of course, PRISM and Snowden and none of that had happened. This was a sleepy little old panel. So um, I find this very, very intriguing. But obviously we have on our panel, like, you know, companies and that may be in the audience as well who are like, this is real time happening. And so there are certain obligations they owe, national security obligations, confidentiality. So we cannot probably, you know, discuss the ins and outs of what's going on at a particular company, so we'll try to keep it at a, at a level that's still worthwhile, recognizing that there may be limits on what exactly um, we can discuss. So We could also not get Snowden to participate in the panel. <laughs> <time>. <laughs> yep, Telecom. exactly. So I don't know if PRISM exists. So um, I guess how to respond to government requests for data. Um, I guess maybe we, will, we can start with Twitter on that one. Um, I, I think I'd like to kind of make it very, I mean, again, focusing on this conference as a best practices conference, um, I'm going to go very, very simple and, and systematic in terms of at least how we see the universe. Um, first, first best practice, please um, publish your law enforcement guidelines. I mean, as a matter of transparency, as a matter of routine, as a matter of establishing the relationship between you and law enforcement, I don't think it serves you when you don't publish them. Um, you, uh, I, I'll go deeper into, well, I, I'll go deeper into what I mean, but I, like, best practices. Number one, publish your law enforcement guidelines. Number two, please publish a transparency report. Um, but going back again to at least what should probably be in your law, your law enforcement guidelines, being very, very specific about the kinds of things you're going to want to be very clear you know, one, you're going to be want to be very clear about the kinds of information you have. Um, I cannot tell you the number of times law enforcement comes to us and starts asking us for, um, yeah, can you give me um, the people's birth date and home address and, and, and a variety of other things. And it, it takes you a while to realize, oh my gosh, they think we're Facebook. Um, <laughs> It, it, it be, you can just be very clear about what you got, and, and that way they'll know like, at least where you're coming from when you start pushing back on, on that. Um, two, um, what do they need to get access to that information? Um, you know, it, most of the companies that I know have taken what I would consider to be a principled position with regards to the Warshak uh, case and content, that you need a search warrant. Um, there's attempts, of course, to fix the law right now in the Stored Communications Act and make this absolutely clear. Please, you must come with a search warrant before you're going to get content. Um, but you, of course, if you're going to have law enforcement guidelines, be very clear in there, too. That way you don't have law enforcement coming with a subpoena and expecting to get, like, everything. Um, 
number three, though you should have a very clear understanding of what you mean by emergency requests, if you accept emergency requests. Um, many of the companies, I think, you know, including uh, us, as a general matter, are companies that, that really adhere to the strictures of, of the Stored Communication Act in terms of defining the exigency. Um, and so if you are going to be very narrowly construing that exigency, put it into your law enforcement guidelines. That way, when they come to you, they don't just simply say, you know what, um, this, this, this woman just, just, you know, someone stole her, her slippers, and so we really need this information right, right now. It's an emergency. Please give it, hand it over right now. You can at least have a reasonable conversation and point to your law enforcement guidelines and say, nah, I don't think that counts. Um, I wish that was not a hypothetical, um, but... <laughs> Um, and then the transparency report, I mean, I, again, you know, I, massive kudos to Google for paving the way, so to speak, and pushing what is, and, and in essence, kind of pushing the envelope in terms of what's actually in that transparency report. It, I, I really do think it serves all of our users to have that information outright there in a way that, um, where people can actually see what's going on with regards to um, the relationship between law enforcement and their citizenry. And, and that goes to with the current debate regarding whether national security letters should be in there and, and FISA requests should be in there and things like that. So, I'll just, uh, just to add to that, I think we probably have a similar approach at LinkedIn, which is to say we, we do have law enforcement guidelines, but I think what Ben is sort of saying is um, what you're trying to do is you're trying to educate law enforcement officials and some of them will be very savvy on social media issues and some of them are definitely not. And it's about sort of showing patience and teaching. And over time those relationships will get better. So they'll only come to you and ask for the stuff that they know that, you know, they really need. They'll do it in a way that's very clear and that you can sort of respond and they know how you'll respond to overbroad requests or can I have all the information you have on John Smith? You're, well, there's a lot of John Smiths on LinkedIn. Which of the many are you talking about? So let's Let's sort of clarify. We want to know exactly who they're looking for, and our goal always is, is to produce what you know is minimally necessary to comply with law and the actual request. And um, just on the transparency point, we absolutely um, agree on that. Where there's a lot of companies that have great practices, and uh, to those of you who aren't familiar, I invite you to go look at EFF. They've got their transparency reports, and there's lots of companies that do these, including Microsoft, LinkedIn, and, and um, it's it's a great way to sort of for people to educate themselves about. Um, What's going on? Yeah, I, I just want to add um, one quick point that might be a little more philosophical. But at, at Dropbox, we want people to store their most important stuff in their Dropbox, so their, their tax returns and the stuff that is most important to them. And we want them to be comfortable storing that stuff in their Dropbox. And so part of the, part of the way um, that can happen is if we have the Fourth Amendment protecting that content. And so we take a we take a look we take a look at this and we think at this problem and think, well, if law enforcement is asking for your information and they're getting a warrant. Um, the same standards that would apply if they're going to come into your den and come into your filing cabinet should apply to your Dropbox. There should be really no distinction because there's no distinction in the way people live their lives. Um, so the consequences of that would be people should get notice about this stuff. If the government's coming after you and they're, they want to search in your den, um, barring some corner cases, you're going to know about it. They'll leave a return. They'll knock on the door. So we want to be able to provide notice to our users. Um, and also the overbreath point um, that Sarah brought up I think is a really good one. Uh, a warrant, there's a specificity requirement within the Fourth Amendment, and we want that applied to, to apply to your Dropbox, too. You don't, they don't come with a warrant saying, I want to search everything in your house and everything in your car and everything you've ever had access to. Um, so too, it would be inappropriate to say, I want everything in your Dropbox. So we're taking the Fourth Amendment physical world jurisprudence, and we want to engraft that into what's happening in your Dropbox. And that's, that's the lens through which we view this issue. I, I think if I can just quickly name drop a, a law review article. <laughs> it's actually Stanford Law Review article, Oren Kerr. I suspect many of us on this panel have been um, thought he's done some good thinking on this. And so to those of you who like to read law review articles, Oren Kerr wrote one. And it uh, does the Fourth Amendment uh, as applied to the internet. It's a, it's a great, interesting article. Now, I'm, I'm just curious because I read um, the privacy policies, and they usually say something generic to the consumer we will produce your data in response to valid legal process or something generic, um, which doesn't, I mean, so there are a lot of guidelines behind that. Has there ever been an effort to actually publicly disclose what these sort of law enforcement guidelines are, or is that considered like confidential proprietary work product of the company? Uh, well, for Dropbox, we have a law enforcement guidebook that we publish. We have a transparency report that we publish. Um, it's, an important, it's a really important issue for us, I and mean, we don't get a lot of requests, so we're not in the category of 
Twitter, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, like we're not in that, on that scale, but since the data that people have in their Dropbox is so important, this is really front and center and within our legal department is something that we care about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we publish a transparency report, we publish law enforcement guidebook, the guidebook says you need a warrant to get, the con to get that content, um, we provide notice mm -hmm. um, and it sets forth those principles um, to, our, to our users. Anybody else? I think it's an important point that you mm -hmm. make that a company has to decide for themselves where they want to be on that spectrum, right? There's some requests you will have to answer regardless of what you say in your guidelines, regardless of what you say to your consumers, and it's whatever the law is. And then there's situations where you may want to cooperate with law enforcement. You want them to help you, or that you want them to help protect the user. And then there's this gray zone where you get some warrants maybe from another country and so on. You don't really know exactly if they're right on. And I think for the type of situations in this other two buckets that I'm mentioning here, the companies want to reserve some flexibility so that if they do cooperate and disclose something that they don't get sued over it, right? Mm -hmm. So they're walking a, a, a tightrope walk there. If they're too much reserving everything, and there's lots of privacy policies that say, we reserve the right to disclose it if we believe that we might have a legitimate interest maybe. Right. And there's lots of those. And we've had telecommunication service provider argue in court that it's their free speech right to disclose whatever information they want to the government. Those are things that have been said in front of US courts about disclosing user data. So companies are in the middle of that. And I think we've heard some very good practices here. Whether they're best practice, a previous um, speaker here, general counsel a few years ago said, Best practice is whatever works best for your particular company, right? So there's some companies where that works really well and that's important to them and the users have more trust and they will go to these companies. Mm -hmm. And there's other companies that may have to, a greater interest to cooperate more with law enforcement to keep fraudsters off the platform or predators or so. And maybe they, that's not the best practice for them. Maybe they have to reserve more rights to cooperate with law enforcement because it's more important to them to keep it safe and secure than to protect the privacy. Some platforms want free speech. It's really important that people can be anonymous posting and so on. And other platforms say people behave better if they have their name down and we are not interested to protect somebody who's getting in trouble with the law. So I think the best practice is probably to start thinking about what is good for your company. And if you're in a situation like the company where you want to build trust and you want people to upload really sensitive stuff and exercise free speech and so on, and those um, practices are really good ones where you mm -hmm. promise a lot on the platform so you could later oppose law enforcement and say, I can't do it. And if you're in a situation where you want to cooperate and share more and even on a suspicion be able to do that, then maybe a different policy would be good. Exactly. And now I'm going to turn over to Joe because um, he was the government. Yeah, so in my, for, in my <laughs> former life, you know, I issued process and I issued subpoenas, search warrants, uh, and 2703D court orders uh, which, all the time. Which means? Court orders for um, transactional records largely from uh, regulated internet service mm -hmm. providers and the like. And I think, and, and now spend a lot of time helping companies who are receive, on the receiving end of, of, those ref, of those processes on the criminal side as well as on the intel side, uh, NSL letters and the like. I'm going to confine my remarks today to the, to the criminal side. If people want to talk offline or after, afterwards about the intel uh, decision trees, I'm happy to do that. But I think we have enough to cover just on the criminal side. I think how you respond to those requests really does depend first and foremost on whether or not it's a criminal uh, inquiry or an intel inquiry. And assuming that it's a criminal inquiry, then your established ways of, of responding to that, I think, are, are a little bit clearer. Um, I think you have to understand first whether you're on in the in the world of a voluntary request for information, the government in connection with the criminal investigation just coming to you and asking for information from you, and they do that more than you would think, um, or whether you're in the context of a compulsory uh, process situation where the government is serving you with a grand jury subpoena or a court order or a search warrant compelling you to turn that over. I think you also have to understand whether or not you are governed by federal statutes like the uh, Electronic Communications Privacy Act or the SCA. Not every company in this room is. Many are, but many are not. If you are, then you obviously have to comply with the restrictions on those statutes, which set forth very clear guidelines as to what you can turn over and when. If you're not, um, then you have things, you know, you also still need to look at like your user agreements and your internal policies as well. So here are, I think the, the most important questions to ask when you get uh, a law enforcement request. First of all, 
is it facially valid? I mean, is it kind of all there? And you would be surprised at how many times companies will get a uh, process that is partial, incomplete, uh, missing key pieces of it, and they'll just go ahead and respond. Uh, that's, that's not the right way to go about it. The first thing to do is, is this kind of on its face something that, you know, looks to be what it purports to be and is complete? That's the first question. The second question is, is it legally valid? And that's, again, where you're going to have to do an ECBA or, or an SCA uh, analysis if you're governed by those statutes or not. But is it legally valid? Is it, you know, from an agency that has jurisdiction uh, to subpoena you? Is it from a grand jury in a criminal investigation? Is it from a recognized prosecutor in a court of competent jurisdiction? You know, have you satisfied yourself that it is lawfully issued? Not that you need to do a whole really, you know, long detailed analysis of that, but you know, you want to have some analysis, some comfort that this thing was legally and validly issued. The next thing to think about is, okay, you know, can I comply with it? Uh, I've seen a lot of, uh, of process issued which the recipient simply could not comply with. I mean, Ben's example is a quintessential one. You know, give us subscriber information, well, we don't keep that. But it can get a little bit more nuanced and, and, uh, and a little bit more delicate than that as well. Your company may not keep records in the format or for the period of time in which you've been requested for that information. And so, you know, you can't just kind of ham-handedly cobble together something to turn over. You actually have to pick up the phone and talk to someone and say, look, we'd love to comply with your facially valid, legally valid request, but we just don't keep it this way. And so you need to tell me what, you know, you expect me to do, or you need to issue another process. Uh, and I think, you know, where companies have bollocks things up, it's where they haven't gone through that analysis and do done those three things. The next thing I think you have to ask yourself is, are there any legal prohibitions on me giving over this information? Which is different than, was it validly issued, right? And this can come up, obviously, and it does come up a lot of times in cross-border cases, where it may be uh, prohibited under the law of a foreign jurisdiction for you to give over the, the information uh, in question to law enforcement officials here in the United States or overseas, vice versa, in a, in a foreign request. Unfortunately, as a general matter, that doesn't help much when it comes to U.S. regulators or U.S. courts, and litigants are not terribly successful when they've said that, you know, they'll get in trouble with the privacy commissioner of country A if they turn over records to U.S. law enforcement officials in connection with, you know, a grand jury investigation of A. But again, at least you have to ask that question and maybe use that as a basis for your conversation uh, with law enforcement. And then I think beyond those kind of key legal points, there are some softer points that nonetheless bear merit. One is, you know, is this request overly broad? You know, does the government, okay, fine, they legally can ask for it, it's within their rights, I'm, I'm totally allowed to give it over, but do they really need all of this? And is there any way that I can just kind of minimize this request, find out what they really want? And you're going to do that not only because it's going to make you look good to your customers and your consumers, it's also going to save you money in terms of the actual time and expense of production. So I think it does help to have a conversation with the regulator or the government to find out really what they need and at least try and give them what they need at first with some understanding that if they need more, they can come back to you. And obviously, you memorialize that in a letter to them. And then finally, and I, don't, I say finally temporarily, not finally because it's the least important thing, I think you want to ask, are there kind of any business or other considerations that you want to think about or need to think about? You know, what, are, what would your customer reactions be if you turn this information over? Um, is there any reason not to do it other than uh, a legal reason not to do it? And that's where I think you need to be careful. Because if you are not complying with a legal request, because of some business as opposed to some legal reason, and you've complied with very similar identical requests along the way, it's going to be a little harder to explain that to a court or to a judge if the government moves to compel. So I think you need to think through that process very, very carefully. Obviously, there are other considerations, but I think those are kind of the key ones and the key decision matrix that I see clients go through, uh, and that I think is, on the criminal side at least, not the intel side, uh, the most common recurring um, decision tree. Now, I had a question. So he went through a very um, sort of detailed outline of how to analyze this. So practically speaking, best practices, are you going to hire an army of paralegals to do this? Are you going to have a checklist? How do you operationalize something that is so fact specific? And personally, ECPA is the hardest statute I've ever read. And you know, it's just it's incredibly complicated. So I'm just wondering um, if any um, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, Dropbox can kind of tell us just, you know, how do you sort of set up a legal department function that can actually do this and have a, a decent sort of success rate? Um, it's kind of difficult. <laughs> um, I, I, let me give, I guess, like a very specific example, which is um, uh, we have a policy of providing notice to the users where we can. 
Um, so it sounds straightforward, which is that if you've got a piece of legal process in front of you that says you cannot provide user notice, then you don't provide user notice. Um, it's not as simple as that. Um, so we have, um, I wish it were an army, mm -hmm. it is not. It's a handful of people. Mm -hmm. um, they literally look at this, this piece of notice and they scrutinize it up the wazoo in terms of whether, what is the real legal basis for the lack of notice to the user. Um, I must tell you that the standard line you will hear from every ADA across the country is you are not allowed to provide notice because. And that's the line, you know. I mean, ultimately, it may come from the vantage point of just saying, well, you know, we are requesting you not provide notice. We are demanding you provide no notice. We strongly encourage <laughs> you not to provide notice. Um, at, that, at that point, you know, so our, you know, our wonderful team on our side looks at that and says, but what the hell is the legal basis? You know, and it, it, one of the, the battles that we have very often that are not visible, as, as visible as some of our other famous battles and all that, is, is on the grand jury's side. Every ADA thinks that every grand jury subpoena is something that you are not allowed to give notice on. And I can tell you for a fact that is not always true, um, regardless of what they think it is. So it, it's, it's not fun when you're arguing with an ADA and the ADA says that this is the law in, in whatever state they're coming from, and you have to push back and say, I don't think that's the law. Um, but, but unfortunately, if you're going to commit to a policy that says you're going to fight for notice for the user, these are the kinds of battles that you have to kind of staff up for and actually have people that will kind of hold their own against, you know, a pretty, pretty angry ADA who wants no notice to that user. Can I just interject? I mean, I, and I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, it's a little easier on the federal side because federal prosecutors are not allowed to command you to not disclose that you were served with a grand jury subpoena. They can request it. They really can't do anything with you, the, anything to you, if you choose to ignore that request. The state laws vary, and some states, under some certain circumstances, can uh, require you not to notify. Uh, the, the subscriber, so it's a little bit more trickier when it's an ADA as opposed to an AUSA. Um, but at least on the federal side, you know, the, the guidelines are very, very clear. Internal DOJ guidelines say you cannot tell someone that they are not permitted to disclose that you served a grand jury subpoena on them. Obviously, it's different if it's an NSL, that's on the Intel side, but on the CRIM side, you can't, uh, you can't do that. Obviously, it's different if there's a court order that says thou shalt not disclose, but then I think, Ben, your problem goes away, right? Often we're just saying, please get a court order. Right. And their answer is, I don't want to. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, Ben, do they, are you talking to these guys? Or I'm just imagining that you have a lot on your desk, and so do you just sort of do, I do three hours of arguing with the ADAs and then I move on? Or There's a certain amount of the negotiation that happens um, mm -hmm. with the agent. And, you know, there's a definitely points at which the agent is like, I, I need, Ben, I, I need you to talk to these guys. Mm -hmm. And then that, that becomes a lot of fun. Gotcha. I, I just wanted to yeah. sort of point out, like, uh, different companies have different experiences. So um, unlike Twitter, we're, we're a real name network, and we're not known for having a lot of, you know, people put their profiles up on LinkedIn to be public. So I suspect we don't see the volume that you or Facebook or maybe even Dropbox get, uh, even though we have a fairly significantly large membership, um, we, we don't have a huge volume. It's, it's all in our transparency report. But, but like you, we also um, believe in notifying our members and engage in some more conversations when we have to, 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 to you know, wait for the court order that says so we have to keep it confidential. Yeah. Bart, did you have any Yeah, I mean, the, the Ben's experience is, is our experience as well. I mean, it's, you, you make the commitment to provide notice to your users, and it sounds great in the abstract, but it has these very real-world consequences, which, which means that you're going you're gonna to get a lot of pressure to not provide notice, even though there's not legal process or any valid legal basis for withholding notice. And we put it in our, in our, in our uh, law enforcement guidebook. Like, if you're going to serve a grand jury subpoena on us, especially on the federal side, we're going to disclose it. Just a heads up, just so you know, no surprises. That, that's what's going to happen. Um, but it means a lot more cycles, and it means a lot uh, having to having to have people spend the hours doing mm -hmm. the negotiations because it's not it's just it's not a smooth sailing process by any means. Right. Do you ever get a motion to compel and have to go to the uh, state jurisdiction and fight it? Uh, or? We've, yeah, I can't really get into the the main one I'm thinking of. I can't really get into, so right. I'll just hold off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. 
Anything else on that one? This is complicated stuff, so I'm going to move on. Um, we're going to get into just uh, the foreign jurisdictional issues um, as our concluding point. Um, and so he just said, since I'm the foreigner, I'll talk, tell, you know, tell everybody I'll talk foreign stuff. So um. I'm, I'm wearing jeans, not lederhosen now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one point to note here, and this comes a little bit from the children's realm, everybody's doing that. You've heard as a best practice, you have to have protocols how you respond. You have to position yourself in your user-facing documentation, and you have to have a protocol how to deal with the request. You have to people to deal with the request. And we just talked about criminal, and we've talked about high-level federal and state of one of 192 countries, right? That's what we've covered so far, and we've spent some time here and it's been fairly complex and nice and detailed what, what Joe gave us instructions, but you basically have to develop protocols if you're subject to requests from other countries too, and you probably won't have the time, budget, or it doesn't make sense to do that for all the countries, but if you get enough volume from requests from other countries, then you'll have to deal with that too. And it's not, we see in the public debate right now, the Europeans and pretty much everybody's slapping the US and we have no privacy and the US government spying on people and so on. Um, this is happening in every country. This is going on, and not just in China, this is going on in Europe. The Europeans are probably under pressure from their friends at the U.S. Um, intelligence community also now saying in the news, yeah, we call our friends in the U.S. when we need information and so on. And this goes on everywhere, and it goes on with different rules. So in some countries you have warrant requirements under certain circumstances in a number of jurisdictions. It says senior police officer, a senior army official or so can sign off on these subpoenas. And this is European jurisdictions. So you will have to be somehow prepared for that. Um, there are cases about this, and why I'm spending a little bit of time on the fact that everybody's doing it is I think it's in the interest of U.S. companies to be a little more vocal about this and also talk to the European customers about it. A lot of enterprise companies that I work with that sell to the enterprise are saying, mm, now we're getting all these questions from the European customers or their consultants and our competitors and everybody's saying bad things about having data in the U.S. or on the U.S. cloud and so on. I think it's an important battle that the U.S. industry as a whole and the U.S. government have to fight to educate about the fact that this is not just going on the U.S. And there's enough cases that we can share that are public where one country also reaches over the borders. Um, so how to prepare for that? As a general rule, even though countries can legislate whatever they want, and it doesn't have to have any nexus to their jurisdiction, there's no public law internationally that restricts a country what they want to legislate. And we are sure here in the US have solved other countries' problems with Cuba embargoes and so on that apply to everyone. And other countries can do that too, right? But enforcing is a very domestic matter. So if you get a request from a law enforcement across borders, Say your Palo Alto office receives a letter from a German data protection authority, then that is in violation of public international law. They have to go through the US government on that. And so one of the elements that I would recommend is that when you do get things across borders and you don't want to comply with it, then the first thing, the right thing would be we're interested to hearing from you. We're not not cooperating with you, but you have if you want to compel us or send us a fine or warning or set some notices, then you have to go through the, the proper diplomatic process for that. Um, in other countries, it's even stricter. In Switzerland, it's a criminal offense if you disclose any data, not just personal data, to a foreign government. And in the um, scandal around the um, numbered bank accounts and so on, where the US IRS was able to compel these, there's a lot of bankers that are subject to criminal penalties now because they did ultimately cave to US pressure. And so reaching over Jurisdiction is in many countries you have legitimate reasons not to answer those requests. And the authorities will get as upset and they will say, well, I really need this and it only concerns my country and, and you can't oppose that and probably should. Now, within a jurisdiction, there will be different rules on what the government needs in order to compel and you probably won't be able to collect that for every country in advance. So I'm thinking you should know for those jurisdictions where you have a physical presence, where people are on the ground, and what we recommend and we've done for clients on a risk-based, depending on what industry they are, we started preparing them, for example, for dawn raids. A lot of the European agencies have the ability to just show up at your office at dawn <laughs> legitimately because 
That's when the U.S. legal department is fast asleep and they just show up at the local <laughs> office and say, give me everything and they can bring guns and they can get passwords and they can access computers. And, um, and lock your people up? They can do that in India, including your lawyer. Your outside counsel yes. can be thrown in jail if, they, if they're not carpeting. <laughs> but it, let's just focus on Europe <laughs> for one second, which is um, probably relevant for a lot of companies. I think then it becomes important some of the things that um, we said earlier in terms of planning on where you have data and how much data you have, um, not for privacy purposes, but in order to protect your company as well. So if your European office are really sales offices and they're supposed to sell a service, they should not have access to the U.S. server with all the tax information and so on. So if the Paris office is raided and they come in and they take a password of an employee there, it shouldn't give them information about your revenue in the US or how much money you were making in Europe and so on. So data access controls are nicely aligned here from a privacy perspective and also protecting company interests. And it's important to have a little bit of training or at least a little curb sheet that the receptionists have when the authorities show up to know what they must do or can do. In some jurisdictions they cannot um, say I'm, I'm not letting you in because they will actually come in and they will have force and they will use force and we have that in copyright uh, rates, we've had that in privacy related rates, we've had that in uh, competition law for a long time, tax is, uh, there's so many in France and Italy, it's in the hundreds now that US companies get raided and the tax authorities want to prove that they're doing business different from what they said. And I think in all of those areas, I think it is important to have um, a basic preparation can probably can't be as detailed as Joseph was outlining it for U.S. warrant uh, type of situation, but there has to be some process and companies have to be prepared because it's so much harder to later ask for suppression of information when the government already took it. In many cases, they can put um, little yellow lines in the office. They, they put all the data and all the files in one room and no employees can access it anymore and they can stay there for two weeks or so, it's not uncommon. Very disruptive to your business if that is not replicated somewhere else. So it's important to plan for that and perhaps not have this super sensitive stuff in a jurisdiction where you don't really need it in the first place and you're concerned about the authorities getting access to it. We've seen a number of cases turn out differently when companies were able to say in a dawn rate, you know, we don't have access to that. So can I have my password but you cannot get it? and the authorities were then trying to compel and get information from an affiliate company and you say, you know, the Luxembourgers, that's a separate company and they're not, I'm not the parent company, I can't tell them, I can ask the Americans for it and there's cases on, in supporting companies on it. So if there's a little bit of homework done and the corporate structure is well prepared and there's some um, local awareness and good reactions on the ground, then the companies are much better shaped for dealing with these international access requests. Uh, wow. we, we've seen many times companies not being prepared and they think because it's police they have to answer things and when they start engaging then they at some point waive jurisdictional concerns and, and will have to um, find themselves in a much more difficult position. So I think the best practice here is to have at least minimal preparation also for international requests. Remember which jurisdictions you're in and be specific about it and if another government reaches over um, that there is ample ground to reject those. This is very complicated stuff now, affiliates versus subs and your corporate forms and all of that. Do you have sort of a um, foreign government request in a bo box toolkit that's um, flat feed out of Baker McKinsey? I mean, this is very complicated. Like, how, you know, <laughs> I'm just thinking, uh, sorry, I'm being, I'm being a little too practical. <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking everybody in this chair is, is like. That is so nice. No, we do. I, okay, yeah, tell me about That's that. That's so awesome. I have yeah, no idea. Yeah. I, said, I thought you were going to ask as a toolkit that I can push <laughs> my book. This is the field guide to international data privacy compliance that talks about how to put a program like that in place. We do actually have so many requests that we do training. Um, we do um, a small $5,000 package where we go into companies. We talk about their industry specific concerns and we walk them through with. If they're an internet company, it's totally different from if they're selling widgets, the market share and so on, and what jurisdictions there are. We analyze that before we come in. We do some high-level training. And then for companies that are really have high exposure, we recommend doing training France, Italy, Spain, UK, <coughs> Germany, the high-risk countries. If you're in India, definitely, and 
have good protection for your outside counsel too because they may go to jail as well uh, in the case that, that companies are raided there. So yes, we do. Thank right. you for okay, asking great. That. He, he will be offering free t-shirts and a book signing at the back. No, I'm, I'm joking, but I know like I've sat in these chairs and know like, okay, you know, GC, I went to this conference. It was really awesome. I need like quarter of a million to sort of do, you know, a multi-country scrub of EU to make sure we're complying. So we all know what's going to happen with that, right? It's just not going to happen. So I know at some point you have to sort of get to the least common denominator and say, well, the toughest country is X. So I think I'm just going to sort of solve to that, and then hopefully I'm okay in the other countries. Or, you know, I mean. I think it's good to focus on the tough countries first and the good and the bad countries, and that is something that increasingly companies think about when they go and pick a um, jurisdiction for the international headquarters and their sales jurisdiction. I'm a great fan of Ireland. We do not have an office there. There's a number of uh, <laughs> Irish lawyers in the audience. They actually have signs that say Irish lawyers. So <laughs> I recommend that you talk to them. It's a, it's a jurisdiction. They take privacy serious. They just signed an enforcement treaty with the FTC. I'll be very interested in how they're going to pan out. But they've been very business friendly. But it's not been, it's not a tax haven or anything. It's a real member of the EU and the other, I mean, it's not. The EU member states respect um, Ireland. They have to cooperate with them. And the um, a company for privacy purposes that has their data controller in Ireland and not in other jurisdiction has to comply with Irish law and not with German, French, Italian, Spanish, and other laws. And that's a great advantage. So I think that's something to be kept in mind. And when you ask about bad jurisdictions, um, very aggressive, of course, have been France, Italy on the enforcement side. The Germans are completely unreasonable in terms of what they're requiring in substance, but they don't require filings. We heard that on the earlier panel that that might go away completely. They don't require the filings, but when you do get audited and you have to engage with them, the positions that the authorities are taking is, is very, very strict. And right. they pride themselves, they see that as a competitive advantage for their companies, and see how, how that will pan out in the long run, but those would be not places where I would recommend you set up your international headquarters or you try to get your binding corporate rules approved or something as a starting point. I think if, and similarly for dawn raid, you'd focus on the ones that conduct most of the dawn raids. If competition law is an issue, you focus where most of those raids occur, and if it's, um, if you have a aggressive tax structure or any tax structure that, that the people in the press already complain about, then France and Italy are not good places to be these days. Wow. So I promised it's time for questions. So I think we can open it up. Uh, we could talk some more about this stuff. So um, do we have any audience questions, comments, clarifications? Okay, yes. I'd be happy to yes, take that. I mean, I've said on this panel here for the last few years that I don't see this regulation to pass. I have not changed my mind on that. I think that's still way out there. The Irish presidency has completely changed it. I don't think we have to talk about best practices with respect to regulation until 2016 or 2017, so I wouldn't be too worried about it. The EU and the Department of Commerce has recently made an announcement said that the safe harbor would survive the regulation. Um, it is being criticized in the member states quite a bit, so it could be that at some point there'll be changes made. I think the safe harbor works great. Um, companies here in the room, many of you are safe harbor certified, and you know from your own experience that it is taken very serious in the organization. It's a reason once a year to go through everything. You do your self-assessment. Uh, executives have for the long time not signed off on stuff without being comfortable, and I think it's a great uh, exercise for every company to go through, and I think it's a program that works very well, even if there's some... Um, corners in Europe that are complaining about it, and that's, uh, I, don't, I don't see that going away. I think that will stay up relatively safe. For those who couldn't hear, that was Michelle Dennedy um, who just mentioned, by the way, the safe harbor doesn't mean you get to sort of opt out of all other compliance. You still have to comply with European law. Point. It wouldn't make safe harbor easier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, any 
anything else? Okay, is our hour up? I think we are done. Um, so thank you for joining us. And, um, and ask Joseph about the intelligence <laughs> stuff now. <laughs> and he, uh, he said he would tell you everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lothar. Thanks, Lothar. Right, right, great. <laughs>